Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack Leslie, chairman of Weber Shanwick, and I have the pleasure of moderating our discussion today. As I'm sure you know, throughout this pandemic, we've hosted a series of webinars and podcasts. And now that we've moved into yet another phase of COVID-19, I'm glad you could all join us. We established a task force early on in the pandemic and have been advising our clients on a range of COVID-19 issues from communication strategy and crisis preparedness to employee and customer safety. Today, we're gonna to talk about a number of critical issues, um, the path of the disease given the new Delta variant, the prospects of boosters and concern about so-called breakthroughs where many who are vaccinated are testing positive, how best to protect kids now that they're returning to school, the use of vaccine mandates, what employees are looking for now and making decisions about returning to the office, how best to encourage vaccinations and communicate mandates. So we have an awful lot to cover in an hour. And I'm thrilled to uh, introduce our experts, three leaders who bring critical and relevant perspective to the unfolding issues of COVID-19. First, we're joined by my good friend and renowned epidemiologist, Dr. Mike Merson, the former Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and Dean of the Duke Global Health Institute. Previously, he served as director of the WHO Global Program on AIDS, so he was responsible for mobilizing and coordinating the global response to the HIV AIDS pandemic. I'm also pleased to welcome Pam Jenkins, the president of global public affairs for Weber Shanwick and chair of Powell Tate. She leads our COVID-19 task force, supporting clients' COVID-related communications, including employee engagement, science communications, and public health campaign. She's the co-creator of, v, of VX, Plan VX, a resource to help businesses navigate the vaccine landscape. And finally, a warm welcome to Kate Bollinger, the CEO of United Minds, Weber Shanwick's in-house consulting unit, focused on organizational transformation and effectiveness. Kate has advised numerous CEOs in Fortune 500 companies and designing strategies to maximize leadership effectiveness and organizational performance, and has been guiding companies through the challenging landscape of this pandemic to date. So I'd like to start today's conversation with an update from Dr. Merson on the latest science, including what we know about these variants, herd immunity is achievable, prospect of boosters and so forth. Then we'll hear from Pam and Kate on how, on how all of this is affecting plans to return to the workplace. And hopefully we'll be able to, I'm sure we will, uh, have time for uh, a Q&A at the end of this conversation. So you can submit any questions that you have uh, along the way in the chat function. And I hope to be able to get to that. So welcome, Mike. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your, uh, your busy schedule. And we'll start with you. Great to be with you, Jack. And hello, everyone. Well, trying to summarize all the science in 10 minutes is a challenge. I'm going to do my best to pick a few hot topics. Uh, the first slide shows you the current uh, national graph of the pandemic, and you can see we're in our fourth wave. Um, and many of you know that um, this wave has not been throughout the U.S. It's been more in the South, uh, where we see uh, the most number of cases and deaths. And this has been due to uh, the, that's where there are least vaccinated individuals. Uh, we also have seen uh, more deaths or hospitalizations uh, across the country, but particularly in the South. There is a suggestion that a few states like Louisiana and Missouri may be reaching or near reaching a plateau, but most cases are far from it. Uh, one striking characteristic of this peak is more infections, hospitalizations, and deaths in children. Uh, with the highest rates in older teens. Uh, so that's our current pandemic in this country um, right now. Next slide, I wanna just talk about the variants. Uh, they account for a lot of the, the current peak and other peaks. They pop up in areas where uh, we see much transmission in lots of cases. When that happens, this allows the virus to mutate particularly at the site of the spike protein, which is where the virus attaches to cells. The current Delta variant, which makes up 95% of cases in this country originated in India, has 12 mutations. It's twice as infectious as the original Wuhan strain. It's as infectious as chickenpox. 
Uh, you can look at it this way. Each person with the Delta virus infects on average five to eight persons compared to two to three persons uh, with the original strain. We know the Delta variant is a bit, a little bit more resistant to our vaccines, uh, but of course not completely resistant. Uh, I suspect it will be with us another six to eight weeks. Can't tell for sure. What will follow? Well, there's now concern about a Lambda variant, which originated in Peru and is spread throughout Latin America and is even more resistant to the vaccines. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see on that one. We don't know. Uh, these variants have raised the question as to whether we will ever reach herd immunity uh, and that COVID may never go away. And most experts would say this is likely the case though it is possible theoretically that the virus could mutate to a more mild form as we see today with various coronaviruses that cause the common cold in children. Next slide uh, talks about, I wanna mention the vaccines um, and in particular vaccine breakthroughs, they're in the news a lot. And these are um, persons who are, were vaccinated yet are infected with, with COVID. We really don't know how common these are, but there's more and more evidence that they are really quite common, uh, particularly in persons who are immunosuppressed have been vaccinated over six months ago. Uh, right now, these are usually caused by the Delta variant. Um, in fact, what we are seeing are three phenomena occurring at the same time. The, the predominance of the more infectious Delta variant, number one, number two, declining immunity conveyed by the vaccines, and third, more ris risky behavior with regard to transmission. All three of these uh, are leading to the more and more vaccine breakthroughs. The good news though, is that almost all persons with these breakthroughs are either asymptomatic or have mild illness. To put some numbers on this, in one large study in California, persons who are unvaccinated had a five-fold risk of being infected with the Delta strain compared to vaccinated individuals and a 29-fold risk of being hospitalized. However, it is important to note that vaccinated persons who are infected with the virus are infectious and can transmit the virus to another person. Fourth, let me touch on the boosters. Um, recently, um, our government, Health and Human Services, uh, next slide, announced that boosters will be available for all persons starting on September 20th. Uh, some have questioned the need for these. And in fact, the, these boosters await final approval by FDA and CDC. Uh, I suspect they were likely to occur. Now, why is this being considered? Uh, the concern is that over time, as immunity continues to wane in vaccinated persons, we will, uh, we will see more um, of uh, those who um, are infected, the vaccine breakthroughs have more severe illness. Um, we're particularly concerned about healthcare workers who were vaccinated first and those in nursing homes and the elderly who were also vaccinated early and generally have weaker immune systems. We've seen boosters in other countries such as Israel where there is data emerging that these boosters are helpful and necessary for better protection. Now we need to differentiate these boosters uh, from those vaccines being given to immunosuppressed individuals who have serious health conditions or, or are taking drugs that make them more immunosuppressed, they have been advised to take a third dose of vaccine already out of concern that their initial immune response to the vaccine was not sufficient. And this is really a third primary vaccine since they never really got a good uh, immune response rather than a booster. So stay tuned on the boosters. We should know more in a few weeks. Uh, fifth, the fifth topic, I have two more. Uh, one is the, on uh, next slide, the vaccine and mask mandates. Uh, do they have a place? I realize this is a sensitive topic, but from a public health standpoint, it's one we deal with often. There are many examples where public health actions are mandated. Think about childhood vaccinations for entering school, alcohol blood levels for driving, no smoking areas, fluoride in water, helmets when riding bicycles. These actions are done to protect individuals from harm and in some cases to also protect others. Uh, I would submit that this is the current state of play 
with COVID-19 vaccine, they are without doubt safe and effective, and those who are not vaccinated are putting themselves and others at risk. So yes, I'm a strong advocate of COVID vaccine mandates, and I hope that all employers are going to have them and enforce them. The truth is that sometimes in public health, societal rights trump individual rights. With regard to mask mandates, it's a bit more nuanced. One reason has been the confusion as to whether masks are effective. The bottom line though, is that they're very effective in reducing transmission, both droplet and aerosol transmission. They protect others from being infected. They protect the mask wearer from being infected. CDC recommends masks be worn indoors, even if you are fully vaccinated because of the Delta variant to maximize protection and to wear a mask outdoors if you're in a crowded area where there is substantial or high transmission. Certainly unvaccinated persons should wear masks. Some states have mask mandates for specific settings. Some leave it to local authorities to make decisions on this. And some, in my opinion, foolishly have banned mask mandates. In my view, the only place where mask mandates are clearly and fully justified uni universally are in schools, particularly in elementary and middle schools where vaccination is not yet possible. There is good data to support such mandates. Other steps to protect our children in schools are good ventilation of the classroom, periodic testing, and use of geographic pods. And remember, the most effective way to protect our children is to vaccinate parents. Lastly, let me talk about vaccine for children. Next slide. Um, authorization for a vaccine in children below age 12 has taken longer than some have thought would be the case. The reason for this is that we wanna be sure we determine the right dose for the vaccine in children so as to ensure vaccine safety and avoid side effects. Current estimation is that we will have data on this by November. So vaccinations can hopefully start in five to 12 year olds before school starts in January. It's important that we not rush this, but meanwhile, all children 12 and over should be vaccinated. Jack, I think I'll stop here. Uh, uh, and obviously if there's time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, great. Well, just one quick one, Mike, um, because you know we've got so many people who are listening to this from outside of the United States and much of your presentation and I, just, I know our discussion can be more US focused, but you know, there is considerable concern about equity and, and getting uh, vaccinations uh, distributed throughout the world. Um, so many low and middle income countries have a very, very small percentage of their population vaccinated because the vaccines haven't yet been made available. Talk to us just quickly about whether COVAX, which is the international institution that was set up to deal with this and WHO, are they, are they effective? Have the major countries stepped up to the plate the way they should? Well, let me say first, the, the pandemic globally is, is tragic, still tragic, devastating in many parts of the world. And unfortunately, this hasn't gotten the attention in the media that it should uh, for a number of reasons uh, that are some are very obvious right now. But uh, we shouldn't forget that. And the only way we're going to stop these variants, uh, it took only two weeks for the Delta variant to, to reach UK and another two weeks to reach the US, um, is to control the pandemic everywhere. And there's no doubt we need, uh, the only way to do that right now is with the, getting vaccines out. Um, unfortunately, uh, the international community has not mobilized itself um, through COVAX, through the UN system, uh, to be able to get enough vaccines to countries. And more importantly, the countries themselves uh, have not been able to mobilize, particularly in Africa, uh, their health systems to be able to deliver these vaccines. We have to remember that most vaccine programs in the world the developing world, particularly in Africa, are focused on children. We here are trying to give vaccines to vaccines to adults that have a, that need a special cold chain. So there have been real challenges in getting these vaccines delivered, and we must give this more attention. Uh, there's certainly hope that at the upcoming UN General Assembly, uh, there will be a serious discussion on this. Personally, I would like to see the U.S. to show much more leadership in this area, uh, as we have done with AIDS and smallpox eradication, 
and, and many other diseases uh, in, the, in the last uh, 50 years. Um, one other point, Jack, uh, there is, um, it's been said that we shouldn't be giving boosters or even vaccinating children because there are not enough vaccines for sure are getting to, to African countries. Uh, um, I think this is true, true, unrelated. There are billions of doses that are gonna be available of that very high quality vaccines, certainly by the end of this year, at least one to 2 billion, uh, and are giving boosters and other countries giving boosters, that's not gonna be uh, the issue in terms of getting vaccines out to the poorer nations. We need to mobilize globally to be able to do that in a much better way with US leadership. Right, well, probably more on that, maybe we can get into it in our further discussion because it is so important. Thanks, Mike, uh, very much. I now want to turn to, to Pam, who's going to talk to us about vaccine mandates and the policies surrounding return to work that companies are, are dealing with. So over to you, Pam. Great. Um, perfect. Um, thanks, Jack. This is actually such a timely webinar because last week's FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine has really opened the gates for companies to require vaccinations for employees and customers. At this point, every company should have a policy or be developing their policy on vaccines, um, as well as mask wearing and testing, and also have a proactive internal and external communications plan uh, in place. But developing the policy is a complex decision, and there's no frictionless path for that. The pushback to public health guidance by about 35% of the populations driven this dramatic fourth wave of the pandemic that Dr. Merson was just talking about um, there are so many false narratives and they spread through social channels. Um, they've even driven some to try ivermectin, which is uh, you know, a, a drug made for animals, despite medical community warnings of its danger. So um, a lot of misinformation. The Wall Street Journal did a story recently that captures the dilemma facing a number of businesses. If you require vaccines for all employees with medical and religious exemptions, you may lose some employees who are strongly opposed. And that's a tough business challenge uh, during a time of national labor shortage. But alternatively, not imposing a mandate comes with costs, including the potential of losing employees and their family members to illness or death, as well as potential reputational damage. And if there's one thing we've learned through the past year and a half is that employees are the most important stakeholder for businesses and employee expectations of their employers are high. Um, our own parent company, IPG, has put a vaccine mandate in place for returning to the workplace, allowing for exemptions, um, as so many policies do. On to the next slide. So this is a watershed moment. Um, full FDA approvals come with a strong push by the White House for all businesses to institute mandates. Uh, they've already put in place requirements for all federal employees and contractors now members of the military must all be vaccinated and some state and local governments are requiring employees, um, state, and, state and local employees to be vaccinated as well. Uh, next slide. And the business community is responding. Um, major business groups, including the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable are advocating for mandates, which I, I think I found surprising um, because that's not tr traditionally um, the route that they take. There are a number of business-focused campaigns in place, including Health Action Alliance and the Ad Council. They're urging companies to educate their employees, um, but most especially when possible to require vaccinations. Uh, next slide. Weber Shamick's Vaccine Task Force is tracking what the business community is doing around mandates. So contact us if you're interested in that information. We are trying to keep it updated almost daily. Um, but we're seeing every week, um, especially since early last week, more and more companies are announcing mandates or hybrid vaccine policies, particularly in retail, financial services, healthcare, education, media, and the transportation sectors. And we do expect that will continue through uh, the fall. Um, next slide. So this is a moment for leadership, for companies that make the choice to mandate employee and or va uh, customer vaccinations, to put their CEOs and leaders out front and center as the explainer in chief, um, as the owner of the decision. And it sends a signal, this is a priority, it's urgent, it's the responsible and right thing for a business to do, and that employee and customer safety is paramount. Uh, next slide. So Gallup has been tracking employer vaccination policies as reported by employees 
um, throughout um, this year. And interestingly, in May through July, a steady 29% said their employers had not indicated whether they were going to require vaccines. Uh, and only 9% said that they were required. The most recent data we saw in this tracking poll just came out last week with 20% now saying employers are mandating all workers to be vaccinated. So it's not yet on the slide, but that is a sudden and steep increase. So uh, I think that's, that's pretty meaningful. Uh, and it's worth noting Axios this morning reported um, on a number of polls that are showing vaccine hesitancy is starting to crumble. Uh, likely driven by a combination of factors, including the devastating strength of Delta, uh, the deaths from COVID of, of some several high profile anti-vax and anti-maskers, um, kids returning to school, the FDA approval, uh, and certainly the rise of mandates. Now, almost a million people a day, uh, most of whom we could have described as vaccine hesitants are now getting vaccinated. Um, next slide. Uh, so we're just going to leave you with these important nuggets. Um, in the most recent Gallup poll, 62% of employees want employers to require vaccines, and 68% support the idea of businesses refusing service to unvaccinated people. Uh, we can expect these numbers uh, to continue to rise as well. That's it for me. Great. Thanks, Pam. You know, just before I turn to Kate, because it is so interesting, the point you make about um, the steep increase in, in, in mandates that we're seeing and the, and the lowering of hesitancy that's coming from approval and a lot of other things. But that, that one third, the number of those companies that are not communicating, as you point out, isn't really moving. Do we have indication from either clients who are asking us questions or other anecdotal information that makes us put to believe that we're now going to start to see that group start to, to communicate more forcefully to their employees? Yeah, I mean, I think part of part of the challenge is if you haven't really set your policy in place, it's hard to have strong communications to your employees. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think uh, FDA approval was, you know, a moment in time when most companies uh, began considering if they hadn't already considered how they were going to handle the vaccinations of their employees. Um, and in some cases, um, vaccinations of their customers too. Yeah, we've, we've gotten a number of um, inquiries even this past week from clients looking at a lot of different factors, trying to understand how to balance stakeholder um, needs and interests and how to weigh reputational challenges. I think a lot of um, uh, businesses are leaning towards wanting to do a mandate, but are trying to weigh all the circumstances to understand if that makes sense for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, before I turn this over to, to Kate, just a reminder to everyone, please um, feel free to pose your questions in the chat function. We have a few I see, but I'm sure there are many more out there so that we can get those when Kate finishes up. So thanks, Pam. Um, Pam, told us, of course, what employees want to want uh, from the return to work. So Kate's going to talk to, about, to us about how businesses themselves are navigating the return to workplace. Yeah, so um, I think I want to take a step back and, and put what Pam and Dr. Mersman and Jack have said in the context of what we're calling the great wait. It's been this 18 months of constant change for organizations and leaders navigating through it. And we're in this period of the great wait. And it's not just about returning to the office. It's, it's really also about certainty. So what is the future going to look like? And you'll see that we've sort of mapped out. We started in this period of recession at the beginning of the pandemic and concerns about physical safety, everybody going to virtual, um, you know, the impact of of the economic situation and deeper social divides to recovery. Recovery might be an optimistic word, but people starting to feel more optimistic about the public health outlook and the financial um, economic situation looking better and starting to feel like they were gonna be able to plan for the future. What we saw over the summer is that some of that optimism was also met with burnout in the workplace and people feeling, trying to really reflect on uh, the job they have, what they, their purpose, what they would like to be doing or simply feeling burned out um, given they've been working um, in an unusual situation for many months. 
Um, and that led to what all the coverage we saw over the summer and if it experienced in our organizations around uh, the great resignation. And just as we are um, dealing with that, the bottom line is that now the new variants have really created another wave of uncertainty. And this one is coming at a time when leaders are also grappling with the issue of Pam just said around talent and the impact of deciding to mandate or not mandate, deciding to bring people back to work or not is also met with uh, the war for talent and how do we retain people and what impact will those decisions have on the workforce and our ability to execute on our strategy um, if we lose talent for any decision uh, that a company chooses to make. So if you go to the next slide, uh, that leads to a lot of questions on employees' minds. So, you know, we like to at United Minds really think of the holistic employee experience. And it's while these are all sort of separate issues, they come together to create uh, confusion and questions on the minds of employees. So when we advise clients, we really want to look at the whole picture. And, and obviously, number one on people's list is, is it safe for me to return to my workplace? If, if my employer is talking about return to work, is it truly safe to bring people back? And following uh, quickly on the heels of that, as Pam said, will I or my peers be required to get the vaccine and, and on what timing? And that, that could have implications for employees on both sides, of course, right? Those who don't want to come back unless others are vaccinated and those who might choose to leave a company if they're asked to get the vaccine. Um, when will I be able to connect with people? So it's, it's not just about collaboration. You know, I think we all can acknowledge that the workplace isn't going to return to the pre-pandemic state. There's going to be some level of um, evolution and, and hybrid in whatever future unfolds, but people still are really craving that connection and you know, looking for when can, we, when can we do that and what will that look like? A lot of people questioning, um, could they be happy, happier, more fulfilled in a different kind of job? Um, also, with the emergence of, of Delta, how will I continue to handle and juggle work and life? Schools are opening, but every day we're seeing reports of um, more outbreaks at schools. What, what impacts might that have when we all thought, you know, going into the fall that there would be much more certainty and stability around the structure of life in general, not just, you know, whether your office is open. And then I think um, bottom line is, you know, can I get a straight answer on the path forward? And for leaders, that poses a really difficult challenge because just as many thought, you know, over the summer that there was a more optimistic outlook for the fall, they're entering yet again another round of how do we help people navigate through what is a quite uncertain time. So if you go to the next slide, um, these are some considerations in sort of the three, three big buckets that clients have been asking us about. How do we engage with our employees around these topics? How do we communicate with them in a clear and consistent way? And again, I think you have to look at them as a, it, holistically because they all, while they're separate topics, they fit together. And, and people as they um, think about work and life um, don't necessarily parse them out this way and, they, and they, they're interrelated. So starting with mandates, as Pam said, more and more companies are uh, requiring mandates and so, you know, we're getting clients asking, how are we, how do we proceed with this? Especially if we have employees who simply don't want, you know, don't want to get that, uh, vaccinated. Um, throughout the pandemic in the last 18 months, we've been saying to, to clients, you need to continue assessing employee sentiment. And I think companies have done a really good job of this. And it's going to be more important than ever throughout the fall as we look to, to create some form of normalcy and bring people back. Um, keep it simple and transparent. Be clear what the company will be enforcing and why the decision was made. Uh, be straightforward and, and confident and not apologetic about it. Um, the decision was made and the rationale for it. Um, take a global view. So as Dr. Merson and Jack were, were talking earlier, one size doesn't fit all depending on where you sit in the world. So the company needs to take a broad view in what it's um, philosophy and approach will be, but that may need to adapt for different regions. Um, reinforce the commitment to safety as always. Recognize that there will be some special exceptions, but those aren't the rule. And then I think ultimately respect that not, not all employees will follow the guidelines and, and some may choose to leave. And as Pam uh, alluded to, 
that's a, you know, obviously a business decision that needs to be made on either side of the equation. There will be people who are not happy with the decision and may opt to leave. Um, you know, around workplace reopenings, um, continuing, which is very much tied to the mandates and the progression of Delta, you know, continuing to avo avoid treating the reopening as a big moment in time because, you know, companies are going to need to continue being able to flex depending on what unfolds over the course of the fall. Not pretending that the virus has gone away just because a reopening plan is in place. And that goes back to the flexibility and being able to shift. Um, a lot of our clients are using small and organic versus formal and stringent. Again, going back to the flexibility and point um, and looking for ways for people to connect because, you know, in the, the first and foremost, people are, are looking for those opportunities. And then I won't go into all the detail here because I know we want to we want to go to questions. But I think, again, you know, an underlying, especially in the last like three to six months, this issue of burnout and turnover and as people are already fatigued, sort of looking at this next phase of what does Delta mean for my plans to go back to work, that's taking a toll on the, the, the a mental toll on people. Um, so, you know, continuing to actively listen, looking at ways to embrace the longer term, um, you know, uh, what will hybrid look like? What will the future of work look like? And experimenting with new ways of engaging people and, um, and learning from that and, and trying new things and iterating um, because it's not even in this period of time, you know, through the fall, it's still not going to return to normal uh, when we turn the calendar for, to 2022. Um, and then respect employees who need to work outside the norms based on their personal demands. So we'll continue to see that through the fall as we um, navigate Delta, navigate um, navigate mandates and figure out what the return to work and the future of work is really going to look like. So Jack, with that, I think I'd turn it back to you so we can go That's to great. some questions. I, you know, I just, just to kind of um, extend your last point a little bit, because you and I, we've all talked about how much we've learned from this pandemic, just in terms of, of workplace environment and what you know, what's some uh, productive, many people have suggested, obviously, that the pandemic has accelerated trends that were already there, like, like virtual meetings, we're, like we're having now, certainly existed before the pandemic, but uh, not to anywhere near the extent they do now. And so there, there will be a, a uh, time when we kind of need to separate what it is we need to do to make for a safe workplace. Uh, and all of those things that we've been talking about that will make um, folks much more comfortable about coming back to work versus those things that we've learned that make people more productive, whether or not they're in a safe workplace. And, and talk to us a little bit about what, what you're learning in that, that second category about, you know, lessons learned here on making uh, the workforce more productive. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, we, you're right that um, we're navigating sort of the fourth wave of, you know, of, of this crisis of the, of the pandemic. And that is a real moment in time that leaders and companies are going to have to get through. We do know that separate and apart, though related, companies have really experimented with a lot of different kinds of working and that, and that going forward, we're not going to revert to what things looked like pre the pandemic. Um, and so we've actually done uh, recently a study that we'll be releasing before long on employee experience and what people are looking for going forward. Um, certainly, uh, we're seeing that people have learned and companies have learned that they can work in more flexible ways. And in, in our research, we found that the idea of agency and people having agent, more agency over how they work is something that really motivates people. We also have found that um, Things like deep engagement or deep fun, um, which is, you know, working on truly meaningful things. It could be solving an issue like solving the, the how are we going to bring people back to the office, getting them very meaningfully engaged. And I think we saw a lot of that as we as our clients surveyed and engaged employees in dialogue to problem solve through the pandemic. Getting people involved like that has a real impact on employee morale, on, you know, um, on the employee experience. 
So those are just a couple of the things that we're seeing. We certainly, you know, the hybrid idea is, is certainly something that we know is going to be part of it. But again, it's not, what we saw in our research is not so much just hybrid, but more the agency piece. You know, how and when do people um, structure their work? And it's really about making space. You know, in this period of time, people have had more space to balance the rest of their lives or make time for other things. And so how do we, how do we proceed forward with that? And then I think a final thing I'd say is um, attending to the, the mental health challenges of, you know, with that flexible model comes, um, comes fewer boundaries. And so what is a company's obligation in helping people navigate that as well? And we're talking a lot with clients about in this structure, um, leaders and managers truly being trained, which hasn't been something most companies have done before to be able to coach employees and attend to those to spot issues as they arise when people are burned out and to make that part of the leadership model uh, that, they, that they put in place in their organizations. Yeah, yeah, the, the whole focus on mental health is really uh, encouraging. Well, we have, um, I'll ask the panelists to kind of come back on the screen here. We've got uh, a number of questions. We've got about 20 minutes um, to get through these. So I'll try to get through as many as we can. First one is um, from Mike and it comes from Laura Schoen who Mike certainly knows well and all of you probably do, who runs our healthcare uh, group. And she asks um, about understanding the results of so-called COVID neutralizing tests. Um, that there's, you know, real variation in numbers from zero to 2000. And should individuals with high numbers, first of all, how do you get those tests? And then should individuals with high numbers, you know, delay uh, getting their booster? You and I were talking earlier this morning. I, I didn't quite realize that Moderna seems to be giving a uh, higher level of antibodies because the dosage was significantly higher than Pfizer, even though both use this MNRA technology. Will you talk to us a little bit about this issue of uh, neutralizing the antibodies? Right, so good question from Laura. Um, what, what she's saying, and you can get antibody tests. You can go and get commercially, um, pharmacies, various places offer and doctor's offices antibody tests and you get a result back, there are various antibody tests on the market. They give you a number. And then the question is, what does that number really mean about your protection? And the truth is, Laura, we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of research right now looking at that question. Is there a number that conveys enough antibody that you can feel well protected? It's also complicated by the fact that there's a second immune system, uh, cell-mediated immunity, it's called, rather than just neutralizing antibody, which is what we measure in these antibody tests. And we can't measure that. We don't have a simple way to measure that. So two issues are, are, are we don't know yet what the cutoff is for neutralizing antibody that conveys strong protection. And we don't know yet how, how to measure and make use of information on cell-mediated antibody, cell-mediated immunity. There is hope that in time we'll be able to do this. Uh, and there are a number of uh, uh, researchers looking into this question. Right now, no, it's not, it, there is no number and we, it's, it's discouraged in practice. The, the other question I have here for you relates to full approval. So we have full approval, of course, of the Pfizer vaccine. We don't yet have it for Moderna, J&J &J, and others or at least those two. Um, can you give us just a sense of the timing? Because there is a certain somewhat predictable timetable to approve. Right, that, right. When, and I- When will people expect to get approvals on those other vaccines and then therefore on boosters? So the, the uh, question has come up a lot. And it, <clears throat> the, the truth is that there is a certain amount of time that's needed between emergency authorization and approval. Uh, and uh, that was done um, as rapidly and as safely as can be possible for Pfizer, uh, following all the guidelines. Assuming the FDA behaves similarly, uh, we should have Moderna by, uh, be optimistic, mid, mid to late October, and then maybe J&J &J in November. 
thinking about the sequence in which these vaccines came out. Um, so that's that's the reality, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want us to uh, uh, shorten that FDA process in any way to compromise safety. Um, and I think that's a little bit frustrating, perhaps, for those that got uh, the uh, Moderna or J and J vaccine. But I think it's it's good to be patient here and and let the let the regulatory authorities do their work. Yeah. Um, this is a question, it's a good question uh, for everyone. Um, have you seen or do you expect any companies to require vaccinations for everyone in the household, especially uh, when we get to a, pa- a point when pediatric vaccines are fully available? I have not heard, but uh, that's an interesting question. Because once one person gets it in the household, <laughs> everyone is likely to. I have not heard that that discussion yet, um, but that is a really interesting question, and I'm I'm sure that it's not far behind if you take the step of you know requiring that your um, employees do that. To your point, Jack, it's it's easy to see where that it might go to that. Pam, have you have you heard that? In, from no, uh, uh-uh, not not yet. Um, but I I don't expect that many companies um, would do that. My, my expectation would be rather um, encourage people to educate their family members and to encourage uh, people to make sure their entire households are vaccinated. I don't think that there'll be requirements that they must, that everyone, I just, I, I, it's hard to imagine that that um, could be the case with maybe the exception of some people in very high, highly sensitive national security positions or um, certain kinds of healthcare workers, uh, maybe a surgeon or something. But, but I think most employers are going to be loath to start saying what people outside of those who are employed um, uh, should do. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the folks listening in are parents themselves. So we've all got questions aside from being in the business. We've got questions. As, as parents. Um, and I'm interested, uh, I guess, for everyone's has, well, have a point of view, maybe Mike, you can start because you've been around a long time to see various max, uh, vaccine mandates. And of course, anti-vaxxers have been around for a long time, well before COVID. Um, but we have seen this weaponized in a way politically more than it seems more than other uh, public health issues. So While it's quite common to have requirements for, as you pointed out, I think, for vaccination for children right now, whether it's MMR or so forth, um, and people have come to, most people have come to accept that. Is that likely to change once we get to a point where where we have pediatric approval and we're starting to see schools require uh, uh, vaccination for COVID like they do for other childhood diseases? Do you mean, will there be less uh, vaccine hesitancy? Yeah. yeah. I mean, are we, or, or put the other way, because this has been politicized, do we think there's more of a pushback by parents for a COVID vaccine than there would be for other vac- vaccinations that they're currently? Requiring? Yeah, well, there, ha- yeah, and I, there has been, and um, it's not just in the U.S. I can, you know, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, we've seen it in other vaccines as well, as you mentioned. Um, I think what's really different now, if I had to pick one thing that flames this, and uh, you know, Pam maybe can speak to this also, is, is the social media aspect. The 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 fact that um, this, inf- you know, I don't the the rapid rise in social media in the last five ten years has what's I think inflamed this issue. It's of course it's had a political dimension, but but it's been ab- you're able to flame the fire. Through social media. And so I, I really think that the, the real challenge in the communication, you know, you're a great communications firm. And I, I really think this is an area where people in public health really need more help, more advice from those that are experts in communication, and particularly how to deal with social media, uh, and how to deal with this challenge that you mentioned. And, and uh, I, I worry that this is going to come up with future interventions, future public health interventions. Uh, and, and I think we need to all get better at anticipating it and planning for it and then dealing with it. And 
This is where I think, as I say, uh, experts in communication can help us. You know, there's been a lot of attacks on Facebook uh, and, and we can blame Facebook or we cannot blame Facebook. Depends on your view of the First Amendment, I guess. But, but I do think this needs more attention. Yeah, Pam, you have, you have thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, we are doing a lot of work in the area of misinformation and disinformation and, and working with clients, not just in healthcare, but in other sectors as well, because there is... Um, there's a real media security problem. It is, it, there's no silver bullet. Um, that's for sure. I think uh, the, the platforms themselves have to do more um, than they're doing because some of this is being driven by very sophisticated, automated, um, you know, bots that are able to put out massive amounts of disinformation. Um, the CDC is, is absolutely um, addressing this and, um, and working with the platforms and um, trying to to uh, uh, counter some of the narratives that um, in which there's misinformation. I spoke with someone at the CDC who made the comment that sometimes it's frustrating when they put one piece of content um, on a social platform and they see it drive ten times the negative, you know, responses. Uh, it, it gets, you know, it's worrisome to them that they're they're trying to put good information out there that educates people, and it actually in some ways fuels um, misinformation. So people see that. Um, so these are, these are the tough challenges that we have. And I, I don't, you know, those aren't going away soon. I think part of this is understanding who is driving those narratives um, and how to make sure that you're at least not placing your, uh, your content in some of the wrong places where it just fuels it. Yeah. You know, um, one of the thing I'd, I'd love uh, the group to actually weigh in on. Mike and I have talked about this before. Academia is pretty rigid, it turns out. Most, most, uh, certainly most private universities have been pretty tough. Your, your, uh, our association is with Duke. Duke not only says you have to have a vaccine, they'll fire anyone by October 1st or something that doesn't and never allow them to apply for a job again. And students are all being required to have uh, vaccination. Is there something that's different that we learn in academia that the, the, the workplace hasn't gotten? Most companies have not gotten to that level yet. And Pam pointed out, many of them are juggling this concern about losing uh, employees in a time of, of, of shortage. But what, what are we learning from campuses as they're now, this is just as the week they're all returning. I haven't seen any news stories of protests on campus by students or anything, but is something going on that we don't, we don't know about on campus? Well, I, I can only say that um, it, there hasn't been protest and I, uh, maybe it's something about education. I don't know. Um, parents don't object. Uh, we haven't we do allow medical and, and uh, religious exemptions. They're very few though, Jack. Um, I mean, they can't they can have them. Uh, we have health systems that also are involved in this, most of the large universities. But, but I, I, I think they, um, the main thing that turned this around was the feeling that education, at least at the college level, wasn't the same online. And that people really felt that you could not get a meaningful college education simply by online classes. If I had to pick one thing that influenced the decision, it was the pressure, including from students, that they wanted to be online and that they didn't want to be online. They wanted to be with their classmates. There was something about a college education that was more than just taking classes. And I don't know. We'll see what happens. There have been already we know there have been breakthroughs on campuses. Campuses are, are learning to deal with them. Uh, if everyone is vaccinated, breakthroughs don't create a major problem uh, so far. So, but I'm interested in how Pam and Kate see, uh, see universities and why they think it's different. What do you all, what do you all think on it, Pam? I don't know. I was, I was looking to kick it to Kate, who has <laughs> a stronger workplace experience than than I do. I, you know, I actually there have been some student protests, actually. Um, and uh, but they, you know, they haven't gone anywhere because 
it's clear legally that the schools have the right to do this. And, and if people don't want to comply, they don't need to go to school. <laughs> they can, there's other alternatives um, for education. So um, I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, that, that um, schools are kind of closed ecosystems. And um, I think what's happened in areas where I live in Maryland, and I'm seeing all of the major universities, University of Maryland and others, um, those mandates have a ripple effect in the communities. And uh, so uh, when you start to have that many people vaccinated um, in one area and the requirements even to go to a concert or an event or something on campus, um, it really does have a positive ripple effect in that whole community. So I, I hope that actually becomes a bit of a model for the business community to use uh, to put some of those same kinds of, of, uh, of policies in place um, to protect more people. Yeah. Kate, I don't know, I, have you, I, I, do we I, have any universities that we're working with or any lessons learned from a workplace standpoint? I, I you know, I think that, I guess the thing that I would add is, is the difference, you know, obviously universities um, generate income as well. But I think if you, you know, there's a piece um, in the Wall Street Journal last week about CEOs who are in a sort of dilemma of they want to do a mandate, but they're also facing what we talked about. And, and um, Jack, you just mentioned this with the great resignation that they know they're in, in parts of the country, they may really lose a number of employees and can they, and they're weighing that economically. Um, so I think you see some of that, which may, and I don't know, I mean, Dr. Merson, you may have a point of view on that. If it's, if that bottom line impact and sort of, are we going to be able to deliver, um, is different than what you would see in a, in a university. Uh, but I think there are CEOs out there who would like to do it and are, are trying to do the over under calculation on what impact that may ultimately have which obviously the long-term impact is that you could end up with a fifth wave and more, more impact on your company from that perspective. But I think there's just a lot of considerations that they're weighing. Yeah, and I think by the way, we're also companies, there was a story in Fortune today, companies are kind of constantly assessing um, how much more productive we really are in the virtual environment. I mean, Mike, the real, what made me think of that is what Mike just saying that, you know, there's, there's a growing consensus that in education anyway, the virtual, uh, while it was great, we had that uh, as a backup, that's not the way most universities want to go. They want in-person learning. They feel it's more effective. Companies are beginning, I think, to think more and more and, and, and employees are recognizing the value more and more of the human interaction that comes with being in the office. That's what was in the fortunate piece today, which seems to indicate that more, you know, we went through a period where we thought all of our employees wanted to stay home and continue kind of working the way they are. This indicates, no, actually, they want to try to find a way to still have that interaction, but perhaps a better, better balance. I got one question because we've only got a few minutes left, which is an interesting one that we can end on because it relates a little bit to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. It says, it seems that some companies continue to delay their opening plan for one reason or another, for a next wave coming case count rising, et cetera. Rather than take a stand and move forward with a reopening plan, they just move the finish line to another time. Companies that do this are going to find it harder and harder to resume online operations versus companies that have developed a plan and moved forward, uh, adjusting, of course, with, uh, with all safety measures. Any thoughts on this? Um, this really, I think, more is for Pam and Kate. But, you know, we... All of our clients, it seems, or many of them certainly have reevaluated at the end of the summer, at least in the States. Uh, I'm not so sure about, about Europe and the rest of the world, but here. Um, thoughts on that? And we, we refer to United Minds re refers to this as the great wait, right? Like we, you know, we <laughs> thought we we're going back and then we didn't. And then everyone thought they were going back and then they didn't. And it just kind of got... And like, look, I think back in March of 2020, I assumed we were going back by the middle of the summer, like, oh, well, certainly by fall. And, you know, the, I think, you know, the reality is that this is no one can perfectly predict, you know, when it becomes a safe uh, situation. The, the vaccines have created the opportunity for us to return to workplaces 
Um, but the hesitancy has has made that challenging. And so I think the, the fact that many have chosen not to get vaccinated has indeed um, made it harder for companies, many of whom have workplaces in multiple geographies um, and often in many different countries um, to put their policies in place knowing that the most important thing is the health and safety of their employees. Um, I know for our own company, we, we're watching closely to, to look at what the numbers are and how the pandemic is moving. And it's a shifting situation. So we have to be mindful of, of that and willing to, to adapt to make sure that we don't take a step before we know that we can create a safe environment for people to return. So, and that that's happening in, uh, you know, in every company across the country, those decisions around how and when to return. Um, because Jack, to your point, I think there is a great interest in trying to bring people together in some way, even if it's in a hybrid situation or two days a week or three days a week or once a week, but to try to create that energy and, um, and have human interaction, which so many of us miss and crave, um, but to do it in a way that you, that you know, and feel comfortable is going to be a, um, you know, relatively low risk situation. Yeah. Just to build on that quickly, I know I know we don't have much time, but I think building on that, the notion um, about of not making it one big moment in time, but a you know um, how can you do it in in phases so that you know you're you're maybe bringing a certain group back, or it's optional to come in, or is a is a way to think about. You know, we've seen a lot of companies push a little further in the fall, but fewer who are saying like, we're going to wait another six months. And so when that comes up, is there a way to, oh, to move forward with the plans, but less of a like on Tuesday, everyone's going to show up at work. And instead, you know, at our company, you know, it's still optional. Um, the, the, you know, the plan is to, to open, but it's optional for people who don't yet feel comfortable with that. So, um, you know, I think that's a way to think about how do you move forward um, and put some kind of stake in the ground, uh, but not compromise the safety and comfort of, of your employees. Jack, I'll just add one thing. I think this virus, is, this, this virus is not going away. I don't know what's going to follow, but I do believe it's time for all of us to learn to live with it. And I would encourage all companies to form a policy and 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 open and, and be open as soon as they can. We've seen it in New York here. Broadway is open, the, all restaurants are open, concerts are open. It can be done. It needs to be done, as you say, Kate, thoughtfully and gradually, but I don't think anyone should procrastinate anymore. We've got a vaccine and we, we know how to prevent this disease. And I, I do think it's an interesting question. Uh, why delay any further? What else do you need to know uh, that you don't already know. So I, I would ask the question back to any company that's still delaying. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end. We've, we've, we've run out of time, guys. We, we could go on and on. Any of you have any other questions, please feel free to email any of us and we will uh, get back to you if we didn't get back to all your questions. A really informative discussion. Thanks you all for all uh, three of you for, for joining and thanks all to you who are listening in. So until next time, um, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.